Welcome to Active Web Group's webinar on SEO sabotage, pitfalls to avoid. My name is Rhea Fasina, and I'll be your host today. In today's webinar, we'll go through a number of points ranging from beginner SEO through advanced tips. Just a little bit about Active Web Group before we get started. Active Web Group has been in the field of internet marketing since 2003. We offer services in SEO, design, programming, email marketing, PPC, social media, conversion rate optimization, and branding. Right, let's get started and go through some basics that anyone considering or actively performing SEO should be aware of before we get to those common mistakes. SEO is continually evolving. While you're working with your SEO team, keep in mind that an approach may need to be changed or abandoned entirely due to the current best practices and quality guidelines of the search engine giants. It's not something that we like to happen, but it does occur every once in a while. Just think of algorithm updates in the past, for example, such as caffeine, panda, penguin, hummingbird, and pigeon. Point two. SEO is not always pretty, but it can be if it's involved early enough in the process of building a site. Bring in an SEO agency when you're drafting your wireframes and page templates so that SEO elements are built into the design from the beginning instead of trying to band-aid them on after the look and feel of the site has already been decided. Point three. SEO has so many different areas that have been siloed up until now that it's best that everyone who's going to be on the project is brought in at the beginning instead of at the end stages, which pretty much just means that cooperation is key. All of the members of the team that will be working on the site in any way, from implementing code, providing images, to approving final copy, must agree to work to get the site's conversion rate to the best it can be. Timely turnarounds are crucial to hitting the target demographic at just the right moment. Point four, you may end up with some hilariously off-base typos that find their way into the title tags and meta descriptions. While they might be funny in retrospect, they will also steer search engine bots and users away from your website. Point five, many businesses start doing SEO on their own and then once they're halfway into it, decide that they don't have the resources available to devote to the attention that it deserves. Then they hire an SEO, but the internal SEO continues to work on the site while the external SEO does. So what ends up happening is the two SEOs end up overriding their work. So each SEO has their own style of implementation. They follow their own method of execution. If you have multiple people working on a site without a lead directing actions, again, you'll end up with people overriding each other's work, which will land you with no improvement of traffic at best, and even with the decline of the site's original performance at worst. Okay, now that we've gone over some of the basics, let's get into those pitfalls that should be avoided for great SEO performance. The tasks are listed from beginner or entry-level SEO, so to speak, and escalate in difficulty to advanced. So if you're looking for the really juicy points, stick with us until the end of the presentation. One, develop a strategy. SEO does not work miracles. I cannot tell you how many people think that search engine optimization is a quick fix to an issue that they may have had in the past, such as online reputation management or conversion optimization, which are both actually separate services. As I stated earlier, SEO is continually evolving, and it has evolved into a field where being an authentic, genuine presence on the Internet is the most important ranking signal. This means that the search engine giants will be able to tell you how much thought you've put into your site and your approach to marketing it, so don't do anything to jeopardize your good name. Publish copy that is true to your products and business view, having blogs posted and published at regularly scheduled interview intervals. And don't confuse your users during their time on site. SEO is a commitment that takes a comparatively long time to show results next to a PPC campaign. In PPC, you can assign a budget and have results within a few days. Depending on the size of a site, 
you'll need to put in SEO work for anywhere between three and nine months to be able to see full results. The strategy should also outline whether the site will be optimized from the category pages down or from the product pages up, or even by the blog posts. You can best determine this by reviewing any analytics you have installed on your site and review the landing page performance versus the overall page performance. If you don't have analytics installed on your site, you can even find your best performing pages by reviewing your KPIs, such as the number of a blog post's comments or the highest grossing product purchased. Two, your industry lingo may not turn out to be the best keywords to optimize for. When you're beginning a keyword list and you're doing your research, you want to focus on two stats, the search volume and the difficulty to rank for it. The keyword tool determines the reported search volume by looking at the query search volume over the past 12-month period, then averaging it. When you're starting out your campaign, you'll want to start out with volumes of at least 200 that have low competition keywords. Once you choose a keyword, you'll also want to look it up in Google and Bing to make sure you're coming up with the correct kind of SERPs. By the way, SERP stands for Search Engine Results Pages. For an example, let's say I'm writing an article for our blog and I want to address the question, how do I get into the SERPs? I've written my article and I've used this phrase as the long tail keyword throughout because, hey, who doesn't ask that question right before they do SEO research, right? Let's check to make sure though. I go to the research tool and I type in the phrase, how do I get into the SERPs? And I find this. As you can see, there's really no SERP name to speak of and they're offering suggested for pension plans. I don't offer pension plans, so why would I want to rank for it or even optimize for it? So that's not the keyword I want to use. Let's try a different phrase. How do I get my site listed on the search engines? While this exact query doesn't have any search volume, I'm at least getting suggestions from the correct field this time. I'm tempted to go with the keyword that's closest to my original, but it only has a 90 search volume, so I'm going to check the other two in a search engine to see which one has better results for my industry. Looking at the results, the search engine submission one looks a little spammy, so I would choose the keyword search engine placement for this blog article. Three, make sure that your titles are between six and 12 words long and that they include your keywords. Bots have to crawl so many different websites and pages that they can't possibly crawl every character on a site. So they only crawl that number of characters per field per page. For a title tag, that's approximately 60 characters. On top of this, there are pixel restraints as well. Just like a website, Google's search results can only display so much. So to ensure that they are giving each entry enough importance, Google also only shows a set number of pixels of your title tag in the SERPs. So if your title is too long, it will get truncated. Let's use the search engine blog that we were just talking about as an example. My first go at a title is, if your site isn't ranking, read now about how to get better search engine placement. Kind of long, right? That's 15 words, three over the cap. It also has the keyword at the end, so when Google displays it, it's going to display as, if your site isn't ranking, read now a how-to. So we need to edit it down. How to get the best search engine placement for my site is better, but we can see that our keyword is still at the end, which isn't good. So I'll make it even more succinct. How to achieve search engine placement within six months. Four, don't use underscores in site URLs. All the uninitiated will use underscores in their URLs because they think that the URL looks more like a sentence and that it'll be easier for users to find. It actually isn't. As you can see here, the URLs typically display with an underline in a hyperlink. So when we do this, the underscores don't even get seen at all, and most people outside of the industry don't even realize that the underscore character exists. Underscores are a component of programming languages, so Google won't return page results that use underscores unless a user typically searches for word one underscore word two, for example. This 
underscore achieve is an exam programming file. So the only way that we could find this would be literally typed in underscore achieve. Literally the only way. So considering that you're probably going to be targeting programmers and computer industry people, it's best if you just stick with hyphens when you need to add a space to the URL. All users recognize it, all users understand it, and they'll use it. Five, apply internal linking. Also known as deep linking, what this means is linking off any keywords in the site copy to applicable pages within a website. The key is to remember not to make the website look like a keyword stuffed page from 1998 like this. As you can see, this page has way too many iterations of keywords and it could easily be seen as, seen as spam. Typically, this process is performed on top performing landing pages to try and funnel users farther into the site hierarchy to get them to convert. This process also aids in raising the SERP results for the linked page because the more a page is utilized by users, the more search engine bots will give it a higher ranking and a higher regard, therefore boosting its performance. Most site style sheets also change the way text hyperlinks appear by changing the color of the font or by emphasizing it in another manner, such as using bold or underline, like we discussed before. This catches the user's attention and compels them to click on it. Because of this, remember to place your hyperlinks in relevant areas of your copy where a user will see them if they just skim an article, which is what most people do these days instead of read. The hyperlink should be placed with relevant content that people will recognize and associate with the hyperlink in the future. For example, check out this review on Pixar's movie Inside Out that opens this Friday. No, totally not sponsored. I'm just totally looking forward to seeing it. Notice that they hyperlink text for Lewis Black, SNL, The Office, all points that will pique a response in the audience. So try to have your hyperlinks around words that will do the same for you your products or articles. Granted, your product may not be quite as exciting as all of these things, but it will end up helping the user retain some knowledge of your product list. Okay, now we're getting into the more intermediate tasks. Six, responsive design. Use it. I can't stress this enough. If you've been following SEO recently, you've probably heard a lot on this topic. I know we at AWG have been talking about it for at least a year and a half now. It's been proven by Google that the majority of Internet users perform searches on a mobile device. They've also admitted that search results returned on a mobile device are highly localized. And while they won't penalize your website for not being mobile friendly, they will give bonus points to sites that are. The old method of executing this was to create a separate site on a new subdomain usually m.awg.com or mobile.awg.com. This leads to issues of having to execute one task on two separate sites, which can cause technical issues such as update, updating one site and not the other, or an update going through okay on the main site but then not loading correctly on the mobile site. Really, the easiest maintenance method is to just have responsive in place from the beginning. Seven, don't have multiple pages on a website trying to rank for the exact same keyword. This is also known as duplicate content. Many site owners think that content on a website is something that can be adjusted after launch. During production, they're more concerned that the site have the right look and feel, so they often write one perfect piece of copy and then use it as a placeholder across all similar pages. Not only is this not ideal, it will hinder your other ranking efforts as well. The search engines have evolved so much over time that they don't need to use, uh, excuse me, they don't need us to repetitively use one phrase on a site. Back in the day, if we wanted to find out what a Jaguar's running speed was, and I mean the animal, not the car, we used to have to use search queries like this that have hyphens and colons and excluding certain areas, including others. But now, due to advances like the Hummingbird algorithm, we're able to just type in what's a Jaguar speed, and the databases can return queries for it. They're able to find relevant information and post for you. 
this is completely amazing. It still astounds me to this day. But because they already have this information, search engines know that, for example, internet marketing is comprised of SEO, email marketing, PPC, social media, and remarketing. So they expect you to talk about all of those parts of the industry, even if you're only trying for one piece. One of the simplest ways to troubleshoot for this is to do something called content spinning, where you take a perfect product description and you then go through and change it up a bit. For example, this product, excuse me, this paragraph from an old blog of mine which reads, much like the mobile phones that have soared into our lives, Hummingbird has made searching Google on the go more intuitive. Let's face it. Up until recently, the only people who could find anything of use on Google were the guys in the basement who knew the clipped alien language of asterisks, colons, and dashes that Google understood. Could be turned into, Hummingbird has made searching Google on the go more intuitive, much like the mobile devices we use now. Let's face it, until now, the only people who could find results of use on Google were the tech guys in the basement who knew regex. Paraphrase, summarize, completely rewrite it, but plan to give each service, product, and info page individualized attention. Eight, make sure you have site tracking set up fully. Most site owners have a form of tracking on their site, whether it's Google Analytics, Omniture, or another flavor such as Pewik. But what they don't realize is that there's more to setting it up than just installing the code on your site. Without setting up the site tracking correctly, you will be making decisions off of irrelevant data. As we use Google Analytics here at AWG, I'm going to use that as an example. So here you can see the overview and the admin screen. And you can see that it's actually set up in three portions. We have the account level, which is the very top level. We have the property, which is where we assign a URL to it. And then underneath the properties, we have views. Now you can see there are quite a few different views that we have here. But what you're going to be most concerned about are implementing the three that are highlighted, which are the unfiltered, the test, and the master. The first view you're going to create is the unfiltered view. This view will contain all data for the history of your account, sort of like a backup. The next view that should be created is the test view. This is where you can set up and run new filters, segments, and goals. It won't affect your backup data. The last view that you'll create once you've vetted everything is the master view. The master view is the view that you'll reference whenever you're checking site performance. Now, on the master view, we're also going to apply filters, such as an IP exclude filter for any employees or contractors who work on your website. This includes remote employees who work from a different office, or if your office has, or excuse me, if your business has two or more locations. This way, your work on the website won't inflate your site metrics, and you can make this off of the correct users and the correct usage statistics. The second thing you'll want to do is identify your segments that you want to track. Let's say a KPI for the AWG blog is a session that stays on the site for three minutes or more. Not only should I set up a segment of traffic for this KPI, but I should also set up a segment for sessions less than three minutes as well. This way I can look at both and decide on which pages are performing the best and worst per category. Nine, have all of the steps in your goal funnels on one website. Sometimes site owners find a really cool tool that they want their users to see, or they want to send traffic to an affiliate but then, after their users are done there, they want them to go back to their own website. Not only is this extremely difficult to analyze, even with campaign tracking, it's nigh impossible through Google Analytics if you don't have a willing and able party on the secondary website's end to implement some pretty complex tracking scripts. This is because a tracking code is set to monitor only one website, and Analytics does not allow for the entry of a different URL due to privacy concerns. The process of going back and forth between sites also makes users confused and they will likely not venture back to your website, even if a redirect is in place. This goes for iframes as well. So try to keep your goal paths just on one domain for simple tracking and evaluation of results. Okay, this is the most advanced 
point that we have in our presentation. It's point 10, and it's talking about the robots text and the robots meta application. Those of you who are versed in the field of SEO know about the robots text file. This is a file on a website that allows and disallows bots and crawlers access to your website. A typical robots file for a site that doesn't have a secure section, such as forums, cart, or what have you, looks like this. What it does is it typically blocks user admin files and system files. And it also shows a bot where to find your sitemap. But believe it or not, there are two ways to do this. There's the robots text file, and then there's the robots meta tag. It's a line of code in the header of a page stating to allow or block indexing and whether to follow links through to another page on your site so you can effectively skip over pages on your site. This tag, as well as the robots.txt file, can be used to stop crawlers from accessing the site. And the real annoying part about the meta robots tag is that it has to be implemented on a page-by-page -page basis. On top of that now, there are four different iterations of it. You can see at the top where it says meta name robot um, content no index no follow at the very top of this slide. That's how we would typically you know, block off people from accessing one page. But you could also tell robots to index and follow the page. You know, so okay, list it in your SERP results and then go to any other links on the page. You also have no index follow, index no follow, and of course no index no follow. I've seen more than one site launch and not get indexed because the meta tags weren't working and it was reversed. So they actually had this implemented on the home page as a no index no follow. This can just as easily happen on a category or product page as well. To avoid stagnant performance, I recommend using the meta robots tag sparingly and to just set up crawl preferences in the robots.txt file. So thank you very much for joining us today for our first webinar in our summer series. Um, you know, this has been presented by Active Web Group. Um, and if you have any questions, I'm looking forward to hearing from you. Take a look for the second webinar in our series, which will be Internet Marketing 101. It should be available soon. Thanks again.